Well, good morning, Pantano. How are you guys doing today? You well? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait a minute. Where's all that music stuff? There's people out there eating breakfast. They're like, ah, we'll get in there like halfway through music. And now they're like, uh-oh. So we won't shame them when they come in, okay? Uh, by the way, do me a favor. I want you to thank our cafe crew. They have moved everything outside this weekend as we're making room for more people. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'm very thankful for it because last hour we needed all of this space. Um, and as we grow and more ones show up, uh, we need more space. And so we're going to keep doing that. So thank you. Um, and it's a beautiful Arizona day to be outside. Uh, we've also got a bunch of people worshiping with us online from all over the globe. Do me a favor. Welcome our online audience with us today. We're so glad you are with us. Well, a few years ago, we walked with a couple families through what can only be defined as literal hell on earth. Uh, in fact, I'll never forget the first one. It was about February, and I remember it because I was at the doctor on a Thursday. I had to preach like four or five times in a week, um, and I, I had a sinus infection. And I, if you know me, you know something about me. I don't like needles. Some of you guys are like, what about these? I can't see that needle going into my body looking like it's going to protrude out the other side, okay? This just looks like a coloring book. But I don't like needles. And I was at the doctor literally going, just give me a shot. Just give me a steroid. Give me something. Uh, make me feel better. And it, as I was sitting there, I got a phone call. Really good friend of our family. He's part of our church in Ohio for a while. Their 10-year-old daughter wasn't feeling well. They took her to the doctor. She was diagnosed with the flu, laid down on her couch uh, to take a nap that afternoon and never woke back up. My call the next morning was from her dad. He says, how do I take my little girl off of life support? And their world was completely annihilated. The pain that we watched as a family went through was indescribable. The pain our community went through was immeasurable. I mean, everybody in the community was impacted by this moment. The pain we went through as a family, just putting ourselves in their place, was too much to fathom. However, the praise that we watched as a family gave glory to God in their pain was something no one could comprehend. It was beautiful, it was messy, it was real, it was raw, but it altered the ground in the community of Mason, Ohio, where we lived. And here we are four years later, and the praise in their pain is still changing other people. I'll never forget the images from her celebration of life as, as her mom and dad are standing in worship with tears running down their face with their arms raised, shackled to their pain but still giving praise. Uh, a community paid attention to their, to their pain and their wounds as they worship through the wound and praise through the pain. In fact, this last week, she would have been 14 years old. There's a foundation that's been created. Her name Shine Like Sable. She loves pink. And so every time there's a sunset where there's pink in the sky, everybody in the community starts posting pictures, Shine Like Sable. And there, there's a foundation that they, they've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last four years to give to local outreach for kids. All because of praise through the pain. Fast forward about six months. My wife, Laura, and I find ourselves sitting in a lobby in Children's Hospital in Cincinnati really good friend of ours, my friend Ben and his wife, Crystal. Ben was leading a mission trip to Romania through the church he was on staff at in Indiana. And while he was over there, his, his little girl, Callis, she started having some headaches. And so Crystal took uh, their daughter, this vibrant 10-year-old little girl, uh, took her to the doctor. And within 24 hours, they had transported her from Indiana to Children's in Cincinnati. Ben was on a one-way flight on the way home from Romania. When he landed, he would find out that his beautiful little girl had lesions and tumors on her brain. And eight weeks later, just like Sable, she left this earth. Within six months, two 10-year-old little girls. And in that moment, we saw the same thing. We watched indescribable pain from our friends their community was reeling with grief, and, and our friends across the country were devastated by this moment. Like I said, Ben was on staff at a church. They were distraught at the loss. 
However, again, the praise we watched as the family gave glory to God in their pain was something incomprehensible. It was beautiful, it was messy, it was real, it was raw, it altered the ground of a community in New Albany, Indiana. A few weeks later, there was a funeral. And when I tell you that they praise God in their pain, I I don't know if you've ever seen a 10-year-old little girl's funeral, but Ben and Crystal's little girl, they had a 50-foot blow-up unicorn on stage. And everybody had to wear a tutu, including the men. And they had a party for this little girl and they had confetti and there were glitter bombs and there were cupcakes. And I'm like, when I go out, do that for me. Even the, ta- even the tutus, that's fine too. Do that, do all of it. They celebrated the life and in the pain, uh, the pain and the, the praise that they had in that moment, I remember lo- what, like they streamed it online and, uh, and I was watching online because I couldn't be there for it. And, and I remember watching as Ben and Crystal and their entire family and their, their other kids are standing with their arms raised. The song they sang was, I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of their pain. A few few months later, these two families that had never met were now sitting in my office together, bound together by the same pain. And I watched as one six months ahead of them on the journey embraced them and walked through it together. And I got to be honest with you, in my 24 years of ministry, that moment radically changed my life. Because, see, when you watch ground altering worship in the, the pain of people and they praise God in the midst of it, it changes you. Like, if you've ever had that moment where somebody is going through a monumental loss or pain or diagnosis or addiction and you see them give God glory in the middle of it and you're like, how? And yet you want it. It's beautiful in the midst of the pain. In fact, the pain that they had was not a reason to abandon their praise. It was their fuel to get through the pain and alter the world around them with their praise. The amount of life that has been changed in those moments. So I ask you, what about you today? What is the moment you would say is the moment of your greatest pain or your greatest turbulence or your greatest wound in this life? Like, what has you shackled in this life? How do you respond to it? How have you responded? Maybe it was the loss of a spouse. Maybe like my friends Ben and Crystal or Scott and Holly, it was the loss of a child. Maybe it's been the layoff from the job. Maybe it was the diagnosis or maybe it was the breakup or, or, or maybe it's the the abuse that you came out of. Maybe it's the abuse that you caused. See, I don't know what it is in this world that has you chained and shackled, but all of us have something. All of us have been there. And and here's what I know. The moments that have impacted me the most are when I see people in pain, praise God. That's the moment. And I tell people constantly, I don't know how people go through pain without Jesus. Like those of you that know Jesus, I I, I just wonder if you agree with that statement. Do you you understand how people get through this without Jesus? Because I don't. And if you don't know Jesus, that's not a knock on you. I'm just telling you, I, I don't understand. I could not get through the pain of this world, the wounds of this world, if I didn't have a hope in Jesus. And so what I want you to start to hear today is you can find freedom. You can have freedom today. Because what I notice with those with Jesus is that when they worship in their pain, it brings promises to other people. Others can't comprehend how they could worship and and bring glory to God, but, but it opens the door for people to hear hope. When you give praise in your pain and worship in your wound, it opens the door for the people around you that don't know Jesus to start to see hope. In fact, as we start today, I want you to write down this little phrase. Worship is our, in our pain brings promise to people. Worship in our pain brings promise to people. I, I want to look at a story of ground-altering worship today in Scripture. And I want to start by asking you a question. When was the last time you worshiped to the point that the ground shook? Some of you guys are like, that's never happened. 
Like, I mean, honestly, ask yourself the question. When was the last time that you worshiped and, and the ground literally shook? It altered the world around you. When was that moment for you? And you're like, that's never been there for me. You're like, that doesn't happen. I beg to differ with you. I actually think that it does. In fact, the place in Scripture I want to go today, it's one of these moments of pain leading to praise that brings God's promise to an unlikely family. Oh, and it literally alters the earth, in case you're wondering. Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 16. It says, one day we were going down to the place of prayer. We met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. They've come to tell you how to be saved. Verse 18, this went on day after day, after day, after day, after day, until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her and instantly he left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas. They dragged them before the authorities of the marketplace. The whole city's in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And then it says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. The city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they don't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks and their arms in chains. Now, I don't know about you, but can we agree that's kind of a bad day for Paul and Silas? I mean, they're preaching hope. They're literally preaching Jesus. They're preaching gospel. They're preaching hope that you can live a different life than what you're living now. And as a result, because the Romans are like, we don't like these Jewish people. They're teaching customs we don't agree with, which teaching hope that they don't agree with, they beat them. They mob them. They trample them. They, they punch them in the face. They beat them with rods, and then they put them in, in prison. Like, this is a life-altering day in the life of Paul and Silas. In fact, I'm guessing their wounds are probably still fresh in this moment. The bruises are starting to well up on their skin. In fact, I imagine the swelling is going to get worse, not better, over the course of the next 12 hours of their life. They may even have their eyes starting to swell shut. Can you picture it? They've been beaten pretty good. Maybe they're starting to taste their own blood in their mouths. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I, I wouldn't blame them if they were like, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. Like, I, I love Jesus, but man, getting beat? I love Jesus, but getting thrown in prison, all for trying to give good news. Like nobody would have blamed Paul and Silas if they were like, man, we're out. No one would blame them if they asked God even why. Like, God, why would you allow this to happen to us? Would you blame them? I wouldn't. In fact, no one would think twice if they're like, you know what, we're just going to go away quietly. We're, we'll do a little underground thing. We'll worship on our own. We'll, do, we'll just be our own church, just the two of us. But that's not what they do. Even though the pain was great, their praise was greater than their pain. In fact, their worship is going to outsing their wounds. And I don't want you to miss that today because I think some of y'all have walked in here wounded. You've walked in here in pain. And I just want you to know today that if you know Jesus, your worship needs to outsing your wounds. Your praise needs to outsing your pain. Listen to verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive what? What's the text say? Earthquake. By the way, that's not a figurative thing in the text. There was a literal earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. I love this. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, stop. He's like, don't kill yourself. We're all here. Listen to the jailer's response. He called for lights. He ran to the dungeon, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be what? Saved. Saved. Like I'm stunned by this moment in scripture. I don't know if this stuns you, but here's this jailer. He, he didn't know when he came to work that night that his life was going to be altered. 
Like, what if Paul and Silas had decided in their moment of pain to give up their praise? What would happen? What if they said enough is enough? What if they'd have walked in wounded and never worshipped in the prison cell? Well, honestly, first of all, they didn't ever experience the ground-altering worship of Jesus. That's first and foremost. And it's not usually in our joys of life that our worship shakes the earth. Do you understand that? Like, it's nice, but it's usually in our pain where our worship shakes the earth. It's usually in our pain in the moment that we're almost ready to tap out, that God moves tectonic plates and changes lives. I know some of you walked in today ready to tap out. You're tired. The pain's been great. The wounds are many. I would tell you, hang on, because I think God wants to show you something in that pain. He wants to alter the ground. This jailer shows up to work like any other day. He's the night watchman, and all he has to do is clock in, make sure everybody's in their cells. They're going to settle in for the night. They're going to sleep, and he probably is too if you want to know the truth. Then these two guys start singing at midnight. Now, I don't know about you. I've got neighbors. I like my neighbors. If they start singing at midnight, I don't like my neighbors. Like these two guys just start singing at midnight in jail. And, and I just, I, it's funny because it says the other prisoners were listening. But I wonder if there was that one guy that was like, oh my gosh, shut up. I'm trying to sleep. It's bad enough I'm in jail. Let me sleep. I wonder if the night watchman was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe these guys are going to do this all night. But they keep singing praise. And it's interesting because, I mean, seriously, who sings after being beaten and mobbed? Who, who praises in that moment? Uh, and who does it at midnight? In jail. In chains. Who does that? Well, I'll tell you who. Men who understand that worshiping in our pain brings promise to people. That's who. And then it happens. The ground literally shakes. So I'll ask you again, when was the last time that you worshiped to the point that the earth shook? Because can I be honest with you, church? I think when God's people gather, there should be tectonic moments that take place. I think the ground should seismically shift when we gather. Like, Could you just imagine today uh, that when we have our, our moment of singing together through worship, and that's not the only way we worship, right? But when we sing in a little bit and we celebrate in a little bit these baptisms, could you imagine if we just believe God could actually move the ground with our worship? Because, see, when you've been free, even in your pain, it moves mountains. It shifts the ground. See, because their pain and their worship was going to be out singing their wounds. And the ground shook. And it's interesting because the doors swing open. Now, I've never been in prison. I've been to one. I've never been in it. I spent a lot of time with friends in there, but here's what I know. If the doors were to open in a prison and I was in, I'd be like, freedom day. <laughs> if my chains fell off, I'd be like, peace, I'll see y'all later, right? Apparently God wants me out. He opened the door. He made my chains fall off. I'm gone. But none of them move. The jailer assumes his life's over. And the reason he pulls his sword to fall on his own sword is because he knows that's way less painful than what the Roman government will do to him if all these prisoners escape. That's a pain that he doesn't want to go through. But I love it. Paul stops him. He's like, whoa, whoa time out, man. No, 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 don't move. We're, we're good. Everybody's here. I imagine Paul's like, everybody say you're here. And everyone's like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, right? No one's left. And this ground-altering worship that Paul and Silas have is about to change everything. Keep in mind, they're still pretty beat up. But even though they're beat up, even though they're in prison, even though they're in pain, physical and probably emotional, they're in chains or have been, it didn't stop them from worshiping God and having a ground-altering moment. And I love what the jailer does. He brings them out. And his first question is not, what have you done? Like we have a tendency to be like, what, have you, what did you do? That wasn't his first question. You know what his first question was? What must I do to be what? Do you know? Saved. What must I do to be saved? See, when you worship God in your pain, it alters the earth and chains fall off and foundations get shaken and it brings people to hope that can't comprehend how to have hope. 
Like this guy is a Roman soldier who does not like Jews, who is now sitting at the feet of two Jewish men that preach hope in Jesus, which is why they're in prison. And he's going, I don't know what you just did, but I want that. How were you beaten, mobbed, left for dead, put in prison and in chains, and you're still singing to Jesus? And then he moves the, moves the earth, and then the chains fall off, and you keep everybody here? How do I get that? See, when you worship through your wounds and praise through your pain, people want what you have. They want to know why you're there. Look at verse 31. I love this. Here is their reply. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be what? Saved along with everyone in your household. Uh, like, I love that. Do you see the trickle down? They're like, if you believe in Jesus, you and your entire household will, will be saved. Like, they're changing generations. They're changing legacy. They're changing and altering eternity by simply praising through their pain. And then they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in the household, and even at that hour of the night. So keep in mind, this started at midnight. What are we, two in the morning now? Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in their household were immediately, what What's it say? <laughs> Baptized. I've said this almost every week of this series. I'm going to say it again. You know what I love about these moments in Acts? Notice what doesn't happen. They're not like, okay, now that you've done this, we're going to take you through a 10-week ten, study. Oh, we're going to take you through a six-month class. We want to make sure you really understand baptism. Now, they're like, most of the time, the people that have been saved, they're like, so that baptism thing, should we do that? Yep, let's do that now. And I love Paul and Silas. They're like, okay, boom. And that, that's the moment where they died an old self, they raised to new life. Those of you that have experienced Jesus, you know that moment. Like 10 people last hour found that moment. 17 in Rocky Point last week had that moment. Uh, there's going to be a handful of you today in this hour. They're going to have that moment that we're going to celebrate of when you die to an old self, raised to new life. You don't need anybody to explain it once you're ready to go. You just need to know that life's about to change. I love this. He brought them in the house and set a meal before them. Baptism and food goes really well together, y'all. See, so today, get baptized and then go have some breakfast, right? I mean, it works out really good. Kind of a joke, kind of not, all right? The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave, go in peace. I imagine they were like, I don't know what that was, but get those guys out of town. We don't need any more earthquakes. We don't need any more crazy. But I love this moment. I love this moment because their worship in their pain altered the ground and altered eternity for a man and his family. And I wish there was more scripture about this man's family later. Like, what is the legacy? Was it uncles and cousins and nephews and nieces? And was it generations deep? I'd like to think so. And notice that his immediate response that night was I got to be baptized. I got to wash off the old. I got to put on new. Like he's a Roman soldier. He's like, I've never heard this stuff before. Like, how do I get this? And they're like, well, you're going to have to die to some of this old stuff. You're going to have to raise the new life. But this is why I know the jailer knew that he wanted whatever they had that altered the earth. He wanted whatever they had that had shaken the tectonic plates of this world. He knew that he wanted what made their chains fall off. Because even though he wasn't in physical chains, he was in chains. And he wanted what they had. And the chains of pain were now off in his life. Not just Paul and Silas, but the jailer. All because they understood this one thing. Worshiping in our pain brings promise to people. A few years ago, my pastor from my home church... When I was in college, high school, college, he left and, and went to church in the Midwest in Indianapolis. And, and I'll never forget when he went. He was in a place called Southport Heights in Indianapolis. If you're from Indianapolis or Midwest, you might know where it's at. And um, he started doing uh, prison ministry through their church with death row inmates at the penitentiary in Indiana. And, and he was working with guys. I mean, when I tell you death row, like these guys were the hardest of the hard, the worst of the worst by the, by the standard. And he said there was this one guy that they were working with. He said, and I gotta, he said, I got to paint the picture for you. He said, because uh, me and his elder, who was sitting in the room with us sharing this story, um, he was like, literally, even behind glass, they kept him in shackles. And it was shackled to his arms, and then there was a chain down to his ankles and chains across there. So he kind of had to shuffle when he walked. You know what I'm talking about? 
He said, and for like a year, we met with him through plexiglass in his jumpsuit and his chains. And he said, when I tell you this guy was one of, the, one of the hardest guys in there, he goes, nobody messed with him. He said, but about a year in, he said, um, I think I need to be baptized. Keith was like, we were blown away. So he said, we started talking to the prison guards. We're like, so can we get him somewhere to get him baptized? They're like, oh, no, 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 he's not leaving here. They're like, the only way he leaves here is when his sentence is up by death. He said, so is there anywhere in the prison like we could baptize the guy here? And they're like, well, or they ask, can we bring something in? And they're like, oh, no, we don't bring things in. They're like, well, is there anything here? And they're like, well, there's this old trough in the, in like in the, the yard. He goes, so there's some water in it. You could probably do it in there. He said, that's fine. Let's do it there. So they set up the time, they come back, and, and Keith said, he goes, I'll never forget it. He goes, they, they led us down this corridor, and it was really dark until you could see a light at the end, and that was the courtyard. So we were down there waiting for this guy to come out, and he said, um, we could hear him coming. He said, you could hear his shackles every step, walking down the hall. He finally got in the courtyard. There was prisoners. He had two guards with him, and he was still shackled up. So Keith says to the guards, he's like, all right, can we go ahead and take these off so we can put him in and get him baptized? They're like, oh, no, no, no. The only way he gets baptized is if these stay on. And the guy was like, I'm getting baptized today one way or another. So they walk over to this trough, and Keith said, we looked inside of it, and he goes, I'm pretty sure that water had been there since they built the prison. He goes, it was nasty. And I looked at the guy, and he was like, are you sure you want to get in that? And he goes, I've never been sure of anything in my life. So he said they get him on the edge and they kind of have to move him and maneuver him in and they sit him down in this trough. He said and at, at that point, the prison yards kind of stopped movement. All the prisoners are just kind of watching what's going on now. And he said, in that moment, he goes, I, I did what I've always done. He goes, I took his profession of faith. Like if, you, if you've ever been baptized or you grew up in church, you know, right? Like you repeat after the person baptizing you. And he said, so I said to him, he goes, I, repeat after me, I believe. And he goes, at the top of his lungs, he screamed, I believe. And he said that Jesus is the Christ. He goes, and he screamed that louder than anything. That Jesus is the Christ. He goes, everybody stopped at that point. He said, and we went back and forth. And he said, I told him, I said, I'm going to take your hands. And he goes, I had to maneuver the shackles on his arms to get his hand to his face without beating him in the face with his own chains. He said, I got it up. He goes, and I, I said, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, as I put him down in the water, he said, I could see his chains starting to just kind of bob in the water. He said, and when he came out of the water, he said, what I'm about to tell you, you're not going to believe. He said, but when he came out of the water, his shackles literally fell off. And I looked at Keith and I said, you mean like figuratively? He goes, no, literally. And his elder was sitting, my wife can attest to this. She was in the room when we were hearing this story. And his elder was like, I wouldn't have believed it. Then they baptized both the prison guards in that moment. Because here's why. Because when you experience praise in your pain, other people will be affected by it. Just so you understand, he didn't get off a death row because he was baptized. Well, technically, he got off a death row, just not the one he was sitting on. You see, when, when you experience freedom, when you worship God in your pain, in your wounds, it's amazing what he'll do. He will free you. He will free you. And I know right now, some of you today, like you showed up and you're like, uh, I, I, whatever that is, I need that. I want chains to fall. I want ground altering worship to happen in my life. I want something different. I need to be free. Well, I'm glad you said that. Because some of you didn't know it today, but your life's about to change. You know, it's, it's already happened this morning for about, about 10 people. It's going to happen again for at least six or seven of you this hour, but I think there's more of you that you've been living all shackled up. You've been in a lot of pain and a lot of wounds. And some of you need to be free today. And, and 
if I could, actually, I'm just, I'm going to walk these over someplace. So that's okay. I know our camera people love when I do stuff like this, but. I think that should be the representation that we see today. That when you go in there, you may be shackled up, but when you come out, they're gone. They're no longer on you. They're no longer around you. And for some of you today, you didn't even know. But you need to be baptized today. You need to die to an old self and raise to new life. You need the shackles to fall off. By the way, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. And some of you that know Jesus, that have been dealing with your pain and your wounds, can I just beg you, plead with you to get people around you that will help you begin to praise through your pain, to worship through your wounds. Because when you do that, it alters the ground of the world in which we live. It changes lives. It changes your life and the lives of those around you. And so it, you're maybe sitting here, you've got every excuse right now. You're like, ah, I didn't bring clothes. Well, good for you. We've got them here for you. We've got shirts, we've got shorts. You're like, but do you have my size? We got them all. Some of you guys are like, yeah, but my hair. We've got blow dryers. Some of you guys are like, yeah, but I have no hair. We've got towels. Looking at my man right down front. Um. <laughs> I, you were just there, bro. Sorry, I, it just happened. Um. Let me remove every barrier for you. Because sometimes we put a lot of barriers in front of us to keep us from freedom. When God's like, just worship through the wound and praise through the pain and watch me alter the earth. So for the next few moments, and I know some of you guys are all out of whack. You're like, wait, didn't we already sing? No, we haven't even done that yet. But when we do, church, why don't we alter the earth a little bit today? So I'm going to ask you if you would, I want, I want you to stand where you are, and I want to pray for us. If you're here today and you need to make this decision, right over here to my right, your left, there's a sign lit up that says baptism. Now don't go anywhere because we're going to celebrate with people today, okay? And 11 o'clock, y'all know how to celebrate. That's what I love about y'all. Y'all bring it. We're going to bring it even a little more today, even for y'all, okay? But if you want to make a decision today, come right over that sign. And we got people love to bring you back, get you ready to go. If you've already made that decision, you know what you need to do right now. And if you're here today and have already made that decision in your life, can I just spur you to worship through the wound and praise through the pain for the people around you to maybe see a Jesus that they need? So let's pray, and then we're going to worship together. Father, today, God, I thank you that you are a God that is in the midst of our pain, that's in the midst of our wounds. God, that you change and you alter the ground on which we, which we stand. God, I pray that you would alter our community. You would alter uh, Tucson. You would alter all of our surrounding areas. God, you would alter our state, our country, this globe, God, by the praise of your people in this place. God, that today we as a church, we just drive another stake into our own lives going, God, as for me and my house, we're gonna worship you through the pain. We're gonna worship you through the wounds of this world because we know that we have a healer that is greater than this world. We know we have one that makes chains fall off when they shouldn't that changes the lives through 10-year-old little girls having parties through their death that are changing lives of thousands. God, may we reflect you. And God, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, God, I'm so thankful they're here, that they have the courage to show up. And God, that maybe today that you're about to alter the ground in which they stand, that through their pain, through their wounds, they'll find a God that they want to give praise and worship to. God, we love you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise and the thanks for being a God who frees us by taking every chain off. We love you. It's your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.